Well, thanks very much for the invitation to uh, to talk to the Wireless Society of Southern Maine. I, I miss my summers up there. Not sure if we're going to be able to get up there again in the future, but uh, I miss seeing everyone. Uh, the program I'm going to be giving this evening is going to be fairly fast paced. Uh, if you have questions, it's okay to interrupt me, but the best thing to do would be to jot them down and we'll talk about them at the very end. I'm going to be talking about uh, Whisper, and that's a Weak Signal Propagation Reporter. Uh, this will be a basics overview. We're going to talk about what it is, uh, kind of what, uh, what, 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 what it can do for you. A look at some of the specifications briefly. It, it's kind of technical, so I don't want to get really in depth into that, but it'll be enough for the inquiring minds who want to know. Uh, what do you need to be a Whisper user? And we'll, we'll take a look at some examples because the examples sometimes give you a better idea of, of what it can be used for. Uh, Weak Signal Propagation Reporter was created by Joe Taylor, K1JT. If you are an FT8, FT4 user, you know about Joe Taylor and WSJTX. Whisper is a component part of that uh, software package. It's uh, basically one-way communication, but with the reporting system that's out there in the form of PSK Reporter, it, it kind of becomes two-way because you can see what your beacons look like. Whisper is used for uh, studying propagation. It's also used to evaluate antennas. It's a great way to compare antennas. Whisper has a simple message. It includes your call sign, your grid square, and your power level, which is measured in dBm. That's decibels reference to a milliwatt. The good news is on most of these uh, tools that you use, you put in how many watts or milliwatts and it calculates the dBms for you. So don't get scared that you don't know how to work with dBs. This thing uses uh, frequency shift keying and for the technical minded, it's F1D. Now, what's it do? Well, <clears throat> basically Whisper works like this. You can be a talker and there are people all over the world who listen to you or it can be the other way around. You can be a listener and there are talkers continuously all over the world and you can look to see if you hear those people. Now, uh, if you turn in listener reports, you yourself or somebody else does, these can be plotted on a map. So this, this plot kind of looks like a spider creating a web on psychedelic mushrooms. But uh, most of the time you are dealing with your own call sign. So the whisper data can be shown graphically. You can also look at it in a tabular format so that you see your call sign and the different call signs that picked up your signal. And you can also see information about your power level that you were sending as well as the uh, power level, which is signal to noise measured in dB. Now, for those who really want to do some serious research, you can also, from various sites, output a CSV file. That's a tab delimited or comma separated uh, a variable file. And you can use uh, Excel or numbers or whatever other spreadsheet that you might have to sort this data and get, uh, learn some, some very meaningful information from it. Uh, what do we do before we had Whisper? Well, this is a quick history. In the old days, we'd make a lot of QSOs. Uh, the best way to make a lot of QSOs in a short time was to participate in contests. You could talk to several hundred people, perhaps even multiple thousands of people. A lot of folks uh, would uh, listen uh, to see what other hams or even broadcast stations they're hearing. There were a lot of beacon stations that were implemented. You could see what the propagation was like. The, uh, the DX clusters, uh, in the early days we had packet clusters, now we've got them online, uh, is a good way to see who's talking to whom, where in the world. The best thing to come along in a long time was PSK31 because in, in, in a, a very small space on, the, uh, on any given band, basically in one audio uh, sp space of two and a half kilohertz, 
you can have quite a number of stations. And PSK31 software had the ability to port who you're talking to or who you're hearing. And a, a neat tool called PSK Reporter was established. Uh, but there were also people who didn't work with digital that like to operate CD. So the skimmers got uh, developed. It took a while for this because we had to have faster computers to do that and better software. But these things listen for anybody calling CQ on Morse code. And then after the DE, here came the call sign. So they grabbed that and they'd add it to the PSK reporter. Well, uh, a package called WSJT was created and it had some weak signal programs for those people who were working with Earth, Moon, Earth, and also Meteor Scatter. Uh, a natural follow-on to that was for folks who wanted to make contacts e more easily since the, the doldrums of the sunspot cycle were kind of going downhill. FT8 was created and along with that, Whisper. So here's a few things about Whisper. And by the way, you're gonna see on various pages these, these URLs that are listed right here. Uh, there is a uh, PDF that I have supplied uh, the officers of the club up there in Maine with a list of all these. So you don't have to photograph these pages or try and jot this information down. You can get the information from them or they're gonna be making it available on the internet. And you, that, that'll save you the trouble. A whisper is a low power application. It generally people transmit in the milliwatts. The very popular uh, amount of power is 200 milliwatts to be used. And that's really all you need. I have seen folks who are transmitting with 20 watts. And a lot of that's because some of the modern radios that are 100 watt radios or 200 watt radios cannot be cranked down lower than 20 watts and they don't wanna do anything else to, to correct that. So you'll see 20 watt applications. I have seen a couple of 1000 watt guys on the air, but uh, that's totally uh, useless. It, it doesn't buy you anything. The, the message that's sent, as I mentioned earlier, is a call sign, grid locator, and the power level. And you can see how many bits are reserved for those. And if you're familiar with, with Bado or ASCII or you know whatever, you notice that uh, there doesn't seem to be enough bits for those kind of things. So there's 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 specialty ways of creating these and and creating a special uh, encoded package of these bits to contain all that information. Uh, the the package that's created by Whisper also includes forward error correction. The beauty of that is you can lose almost half the signal if the ionosphere is turbulent. If there's noise, other kinds of noise, especially static crashes from lightning, you'll still be able to decode the message. We've been talking about the grid system. A lot of folks talk about it, have no idea what it is. Maybe they've seen it someplace. The Maidenhead grid system is used by amateur radio operators and sailors. Uh, and um, it, it's kind of like the maps we used to get at the service station had a ABC across the top and one, two, three down the side. Well, the Maidenhead grid system is a little different. It's got ABCs across the top. It's got ABCs down the side. And you think, well, that's kind of weird. But what you do is you take a longitudinal column first, and then you take a latitudinal row. And over here for Maine, it turns out that you're in FN. Now, in the, in, the, in the area that you're in, Scarborough is in NFN, and Whisper uses a four-character grid square. It's alpha, alpha, number, number. So within that FN, there are numbers that go from uh, one to nine and uh, across the top, and also from one to nine down the side. So FN 43 is where Scarborough, Gorham, and most of Southern Maine is located. A lot of folks, when they hear about a grid square, and maybe they've been confused over the years, think it, maybe it's a few miles wide or a few miles tall. It's 70 miles tall by 100 miles wide. So it's a pretty good chunk of real estate. Back to the specs. The whisper information is transmitted very slowly because the idea is we want to be able to pull 
the signal out of the noise. This thing is kind of related to the earth, moon, earth concept of very slow transmissions. The keying rate is about one and a half baud. If you thought about this in terms of Morse code, this is about like a one and a half words per minute in Morse code. Pretty slow. The modulation uses a phase shift keying and it's continuous phase between four different tones. And the tones are separated by roughly one and a half hertz. I've got the actual specification, 1.4648, but we're not going to worry about that. It's like one and a half. This thing occupies about six hertz, which is not bad. And uh, the actual tone frequencies for any given transmission are selected randomly by the software or the machine, whatever it is. And everybody is within a 200 hertz window on whatever frequency they're occupying on what band it might be. The, uh, the whisper message of those, those 50 bits, along with all of the other uh, forward error correction, uh, takes right at two minutes. It's actually 110.6 seconds. Uh, the transmissions all over the world always start about one second into an even UTC minute. Now, your meeting started at seven o'clock your time. So at exactly seven o'clock, but the, the UC, UTC, so that would have been 0100. Uh, worldwide, 0100 UTC, everybody who's on Whisper started transmitting, regardless of what band they're on, and they transmit for 110.6 seconds. Then at 0102, everybody starts transmitting again on whatever band that they're on. Uh, we talked about uh, the robustness of the signals and being in the noise level. The minimum signal to noise for receiving is around minus 34 dB. And uh, I have heard some and had it recorded like minus 41. And it's amazing. You don't hear anything. It just suddenly shows up. If you're on FT8, you know, when you get down to minus 19, maybe minus 21, you're starting to lose the signal. Well, this is minus 34 and even beyond. This thing called the WSJT scale, I, I would just mention it in passing, it's basically this. The software takes a look at a two and a half kilohertz bandwidth on the audio coming from your receiver when there's no signal present. That's doing those last 10 seconds of the transmission. Takes a look at that and it calculates what the energy level is coming from the receiver. Then when it detects the various signals, it calculates the power level of each signal compared to that random noise that was coming from your receiver. That's what the WSJT scale refers to. Well, what's it sound like? Now, keep in mind that each one of these frequency changes is one and a half hertz from each other. So it doesn't go like one and a half hertz and occasionally it jumps six hertz away or something like that. The most it can move is one and a half hertz up or down. And uh, it, it's going to have to make a move. So it could move up and move back. It could move up, up and move up again and then dance around, whatever. But it's got to stay within that six hertz. And there's a change every two thirds of a second. So let's see if you can make out for this short little uh, audio clip that I've got, if you can make out the one and a half hertz frequency changes. Well, you probably didn't really notice anything different, but it's kind of like the old uh, super uh, super regenerative receivers where you could hear all kinds of signals in the background. When you have that kind of a continuous tone, uh, sometimes your mind can play tricks on you, but that's all you're going to hear. It just sounds like a continuous tone. So let's see what do you need to use Whisper. Well, it's basically this. you got to have a computer. 
uh, running uh, WSJTX software. And within that software package is the WSPR software. You're going to have to have a receiver or transmitter or ideally a transceiver. You got to have a way to connect the computer to the transceiver. So it could be a USB cable or it could be serial cable and audio cables. Could be who knows what else you need. Then you got to have an antenna and you got to have a way to connect to it, which is typically coax. If you can't cut the power level on your transceiver down to a reasonable amount, you'll have to have an attenuator of some kind because the ideal power levels are below a watt. So this is really all that you need. If you have uh, one of the more modern transceivers, and here in this is my example is an IC7300, you simply have a USB cable tying the computer to it, and that, that takes care of the uh, uh, programming of setting up the frequency, uh, other conditions on the radio, and bringing the audio back or sending it to the radio, either one. So if you've got this, uh, that's all you need. If you're already an FT8, FT4 user, you're all set for Whisper. It's just a matter of changing the mode. Let's say you have one of the older uh, QRP rigs. This is an FT817. Uh, uh, it doesn't have USB, so you've got to have a way to get things to it. Uh, and most of our computers nowadays don't have um the, the, the old traditional serial uh, uh, RS-232 connectors on them. So you'll have to come out of USB and either have your own homemade device or use something like a signal link USB that gives you serial connections to the radio as well as audio in and audio out. And that's how you can uh, transmit and receive on Whisper. I'll show you something else in a moment too. Uh, what, what if you don't want to tie your radio up because you want to rag chew or get on nets or operate in contests, but you still like to be transmitting or receiving? So there are different ways. There are standalone whisper transmitters that are reasonable in price, but still require a little bit of cash. I'm going to show you a series of these because some people like to build their own. And the first couple I'm going to show you you probably won't duplicate exactly what they've done, but if you go to their websites and read what they've done, it might give you some ideas on how you can create some of your own things. This is a ham club over in Turkey. Now it's Antrak, not Amtrak, the uh, railroad people, but Antrak. And they had uh, various projects they've been working on and they they recommissioned those parts onto a breadboard to create this, uh, this project. And they estimated if you bought those parts new with the way they did it, it'd be a little bit less than $50. As a guy on Instructables who came up with a really good idea, if you bought all those parts brand new, it would be a little bit less than $75. Uh, you have to be a little bit resourceful. You have a few parts to add in there that you may have in a, in a scrap uh, box someplace. Uh, that, that would help you out. But the Instructables fella has an, some other good ideas that, that are very good. If you like to build things, uh, QRP Labs makes a nice kit that costs about $100. You can put this thing together and it covers most of the HF bands. Uh, as I said, you have to assemble things. If you only want a couple of bands, you can save a little bit of money, but not a whole lot. So that's going to cost you about $100 and a little bit of assembly work, but you have the satisfaction of putting this thing together. The Tapper Tucson Amateur Packet Radio builds what they call a partial kit. It's uh, headers to go on a Raspberry Pi. And these headers basically contain an RF generating source, uh, which is nothing more than a square wave generator with a, with, a, with a crystal. And then they've got some filters, and the filters are used for transmitting and for receiving. You have to supply your own Raspberry Pi. Each one of those hats uh, in the kit form is $32. It's partially assembled. And if you want all the bands, you're going to spend about $100. RF0 makes a very popular board, uh, a lot of the folks who uh, build uh, dedicated uh, transmitters for all the different bands tend to buy this product because it has some versatility 
of setting it up and uh, having it transmit on various on various bands. You'll find some research uh, centers like in Antarctica or in uh, remote sites that use this product. It's uh, put down a hundred dollars plus because the basic the basic apparatus that you see there is a hundred dollars. If you want an enclosure, you can build it yourself or buy it from them. If you want to have a power supply, you buy it from them or find it yourself, you may have it. Most of these use a USB power levels to power these things. But it's about, if you buy all the parts from them, you're spending about $150. But it's a very nice product. Uh, soda Beams makes the Whisper Light. This is really the most popular one of all. It's lightweight, it's easy to program, but it's always out of stock. As soon as they get an order in, I mean, you can snap your finger. It's it's sold out. Uh, this is a great product. A lot of folks buy a couple of these. Uh, and uh, if they're going to compare antennas, they'll set these things up for a given band or a couple of bands or whatever and let these transmit on different antennas at the same time and then take a look at comparison to compare those antennas. Uh, soda beams, when you when you buy from them, they give you a special code to use software that is proprietary to them, and only uh, uh, Whisperlite users can 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 use it. So, uh, it, talking about a hundred dollars for the basic kit, if you want it to take care of uh, all the different ham bands, it's right at one hundred and fifty dollars. It's a very nice product. Uh, I've been told that you probably need to go to some place like Dayton in Xenia, Ohio and be there on the day they open in order to get these because they're usually sold out pretty quickly. It's a great product though. Zach Tech makes another competing product. Uh, it sells for $140. This is the one I have. It's so a desktop transmitter as they call it. Uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it handles all the different bands. Uh, you can get it for, in different, um, in, in different uh, bills. The one I have covers uh, 80 through 10 meters and it has all the different filters for all the different bands that I can choose and it has a, a very accurate signal generator inside so this thing can also be used as a signal source for working on a, on equipment it's, it's a piece of test equipment it has a built-in GPS receiver and it comes with its own uh, antenna that's got about uh, 10 feet of coax going through it and uh, the nice thing is, once you put in your call sign, and if you tell it uh, the types of bands that you want to operate, you don't have to touch anything else. You simply take it out in the field somewhere, give it uh, power uh, through a USB connector, and uh, the GPS unit will figure out where you're located and calculate the grid square and prepare the message that's going to be sent. So this thing takes care of itself and makes it a whole lot easier for making use. I'll show it to you again in just a little bit. Now, how do you view the results of what you're transmitting? Well, you can take a look at uh, the, the Whisper software itself. So on the Whisper software, the main page, uh, if you're monitoring, you can take a look at this and here, here's a two minute sample. And here's some of the different call signs that were received during that time. Uh, this is all, it also will show the power levels in dBm that they were transmitting on. And it also shows the dB of the signal level, a signal to noise that was calculated on your receiver. So this is one of the ways that you can, uh, you can uh, an uh, re receive, analyze, or, or see what's being received. Some of the logging software that is available nowadays include map utilities that allow you to uh, plot uh, spots that are received from uh, DX clusters. And you can uh, likewise treat the whisper receiver as the spotting uh, mechanism and have it plot all of those spots. So you are the source of each uh, point uh, going to a log spot that you have received. So you'll have the these various lines drawn on a map. And th th that's kind of handy. The place that most people will go to because it's the easiest thing is whispernet.org. Uh, whispernet.org, uh, when you go to it the first time, you'll find something on there about 
registering, becoming a registered user. You see on one side of the screen, logging in. You don't have to do any of that. You go below this map that's on here and you'll find a place where you can change the settings on there. You can put in the call sign that you want to select if that's you, for example, and it will show from you to the various places that you're hearing or that you have been you have transmitted to whispernet.org it mentions on whispernet.org this other place whisper rocket it's kind of the same thing it just has a little bit different appearance it kind of sticks these things out with different kind of flags some people like this presentation better than the other uh, something that you can consider you know you, you play around with these to figure out which ones you like the most uh, smartphone apps are, are another a way to display these things. Uh, there's one for iOS, for the iPhone and for the iPad, it's Whisper Watch. And for the Android, it's Whisper World Watch. These are written by different people. And because this was the first application copyrighted, these guys had to put the word world in there so that they wouldn't have any, any issues with that. But these are really good. I use this one a great deal. The fella who wrote this is down in Australia. He's always looking for more ideas and he's constantly improving this app. So if you're an iPhone, iPad user, very good app. Best thing is it's free. So let's take a look at a real world example. I do several of them actually. This is a friend of mine, uh, Wayne Collins. He's a fairly new ham. You can tell by his call sign. Uh, he was uh, licensed uh, just, just about a year ago. And uh, when he got his general ticket, uh, he bought uh, some equipment from another ham. And one of the in uh, antennas that was given to him was this 20 meter vertical. And when he first got it home, because he didn't quite know how to install it, he put a pipe in the ground that was about had about six extra feet running alongside the antenna. And at the top part of it, he doesn't want it bouncing against his house because it was right at his house. He put a metal bracket on it to bolt it to the side of the house. He had a problem of uh, SWR was real high. And once he sort of thought he had things under control, uh, he still had the problem. He couldn't work anybody. When he worked somebody, they said he was real weak. So by the time I got out there with my whis whisper equipment, he'd already moved it out into the yard. So I'm showing you what this thing looked like in the yard now. It's a it's a quarter wave vertical on 20 meters. Here it is. It just has a, 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 a rod in the ground and the antenna is clamped onto the side. Coax is buried, goes over to his house. Uh, we hooked up the that uh, Zach Tech transmitter. And what it was set up to do was to transmit on 40 meters for two minutes, and then 20 meters for two minutes, 10 meters for two minutes, and then it rested for two minutes. And then it started on 40 again, 40, 20, 10, rest like that. And in the first 30 minutes, he was astounded because he said, I can't ever hear anybody. Nobody ever hears me. And so here we are in the center of this whole thing. And he saw this plot and it was like, holy smoke, look at everything. Central America, up here into Canada, all the different parts of the U.S., that looks pretty good. Well, uh, over a 24-hour period, here's what we saw plotted on this map. Here again, here's where we are. Here's the uh, continental U.S. and the Atlantic view. Got into uh, Europe uh, very well, over here to the Canary Islands, a lot in South America, uh, up in the Northern Territories, various places over here in Canada, even into Alaska. And then uh, here's the Pacific view uh, over the 24 hour period, got into uh, Australia and New Zealand. And this this is on 20 meters and uh, again, uh, Hawaii and uh, Alaska. So pretty good coverage on that. Now here's the plot for 10 meters over, to over uh, this is a 20 meter quarter wave. So on 10 meters, this antenna, he had a fair amount of good openings into Europe and down here into South America. And you know what, how 10 meters is, it's kind of quirky at times. He also had uh, the good signal over into a, a Hawaii. This is a 20 meter quarter wave Here's what 40 meters looked like on there. If he could figure out a way to load into it, 
He's got pretty good coverage in the United States and Canada, gets over into Hawaii, even down into Australia on 40 meters with that uh, with that vertical. So not bad. So th th this is one of the ways that Whisper can convince you that there are openings, but you have to be there at the right times. And you remember there was a tabular version of the information that you could get. So if you ran this and you said, I, I sure would like to work Australia on 40 meters, and you found out what time this was, you have a better idea of what the timing is for you to get on perhaps on voice or CW or whatever mode you use, even FT8, to be able to work the countries that you want to work. Now, the other example I'm going to show you is the, the Garland Amateur Radio Club. We've got a, a ham station we call the Comm Center. And the antennas that were down there are the, as a 40, 80 meter trap dipole and a force 12 antenna that covers 20 through 10 meters. We've had a number of hams who have said the 40, 80 meter trap dipole is no good. And it can't ever work anybody on it. And they've also said the force 12 well, it seems to be okay, but it doesn't seem to work very well in, on most of the bands. So what we did was we decided we're going to run some tests, and we're going to point these uh, the beam uh, in toward the east uh, for 24 hours, and then turn it to uh, out to the west for 24 hours and see kind of what happened. We had to pick days. I put a note in here. In July, when we ran these tests, we had thunderstorms just about every day. So we had to try to find some days where there were no thunderstorms because uh, we didn't want to be hooked up to an antenna and have lightning around to, to, to damage that little whisper transmitter. So the whisper transmitter was set up. We had to put an extension cable on it for the GPS because had to have a, the, the antenna had to be by the window, which was across the room. And then we had to also connect into the antenna patch panel. So here came the cable right here to tie into the 80, 40 meter on that. So what we were doing then was hooking this thing up and it uh, transmitted on 80 meters for two minutes and then 40 meters for two minutes and then rested and then 80, 40 rest and same thing like that. And the first hour, here's some of the signals that we saw. Now, this is the daytime. This is roughly uh, one o'clock, uh, and uh, uh, on Thursday, July thirteenth, and we're we're still being picked up by various stations. After three hours, there's a few, few more, but remember, this is still in the afternoon, so we don't expect a whole lot. You you don't usually get eighty meters during the daytime, and forty meters sometimes not you know maybe localized communication, but not that kind of distance. But this was showing that there were some openings in there. So then uh, at sunset, and here's the terminator. So sunset coming right through Dallas over here. We're seeing a lot over here to the east. We'd expect that toward the darkness. And now we also have a fair amount over here to the west. And th this antenna, by the way, is oriented east and west. So don't think that this is a north-south orientation and it's going off the side. It's a trap dipole, and it's kind of an inverted V configuration. So inverted Vs, you know, tend to be somewhat omnidirectional. So we're going to expect a little more off in this direction because of the darkness. But it's already starting to show a lot uh, of openings in various places. So then uh, overnight on 80 and 40 meters, let's see what we got. Here's the continental U.S. We see we're up here into Canada, the whole lot here to the east and over here to the west. Some of these gaps that you see in here, you might say, well, why wasn't there anything there? Well, some of these areas, there's low population. There's really no hams with receivers or anybody that's really active there. And down in this lower area, this is Mexico. You just don't have that many people who are active down there. Here was a Mexican station I see. We had some in Central America and down here towards South America. Looking at the Atlantic view, you can see the Central America, South America, some over here uh, on 80 and 40 into Europe. Here's the Canary Islands. Here's one down here to Antarctica. Well, I'll show you that. That's uh, 
DP is zero GVN. If you're an active DX or a contester, you may have worked these guys on uh, FT8 at some point in time in the, in the past. They're very active. It's a German research center, and they've got transmitters down there on all the bands and receivers on all the bands for whisper. So you'll pick up these guys a whole lot. So over here into the Pacific, Here's the openings. Uh, here we got Hawaii over here into New Zealand and Australia. So that, the, you know, for a, a, an 80, 40 meter antenna that people say is no good, 200 milliwatts is doing a pretty good job, wouldn't you say? Here's 80 meters only uh, overnight. So we have a lot over here to the east and not a whole lot over here into the west. But again, some of this may have to do with several things. One, are there are there any receiving stations over in this area on the west side? And likewise, uh, it has the propagation slightly changed. Uh, there may be some something going on with the antenna in terms of how it propagates in a certain direction. So th that's further study that you have to consider. You have a greater population uh, over here in the on the east part of the United States, so you tend to have more hams over in this direction. Uh, now, uh, we then uh, tested this for 24 hours and we had to leave it uh, disconnected for a day and then reconnect it because of thunderstorms. And when we did that, here was Friday into Saturday. And this time you start seeing a little bit, a whole lot to the east, some more over here into the uh, west, more openings into Europe. So probably something different with propagation, the ionosphere, Canary Islands again, back down here to Antarctica, over here to um, Hawaii, and a few more signals into Australia and New Zealand. So a different day and a little bit different propagation. I included the sunspot number and the, the solar flux index in here just for reference. The next thing we did was take a look at the Force 12 beam. So we just like before, we transmitted on 20 meters for two minutes, 17, blah, blah, blah. You can see this in 10 meters, and then we'd rest. Okay, so what we did was we aimed east for uh, 24 hours and then west for 24 hours. So on the Force 12 beam, in the first hour when we hooked it up, we're aimed east you can see that there's a whole lot more energy over here to the east than there is to the west. And that kind of makes sense. Okay, and three hours later, it kind of looks about the same. It looks like we've got uh, Hawaii now over here. And you're saying, well, wait a minute, you're aimed to the east. Why is it that you're getting stuff this way? Well, you know, beams don't just transmit in one direction. They, they have a certain amount of energy off the backside. They're kind of like a, a specially controlled dipole. And uh, there's some leakage of signal that goes off the backside. So we have a front to back ratio we often talk about. So after three hours, this is kind of what we're seeing. Now, I wanted to show you this. This is the building of the communication center. It's got a metal roof on it and th this is where the uh where the beam of the, the tower and the beam is located metal roof this thing was aimed to, to the east so the building is slightly moved like toward the northeast it's this is aimed over here along the street line which is a oh, i would say it's in the order of 40 feet from that beam antenna there is a uh I guess I'll call it a residential power line uh, distribution uh, that goes along the street over here. Uh, and on the other side, there's a high tension line. It it ties uh, two substations together. So this this runs over here. And then, then this, oops, in this part of the picture, you see these railroad tracks. Uh, we've got a, a railway system in Dallas. This is an electric train. And above each one of those uh, rails that you see is elevated DC power wiring. So all of this stuff is in influencing the antenna and the, uh, the radiation pattern of that. So that's probably what's pulling a lot of the energy kind of up to the northeast. So um, uh, after five hours, we're at six o'clock and you can see here's that energy to the east, kind of the to, to the northeast, some over here 
uh, in this direction. We're, we've got openings into Australia. So that's uh, that's right. It's sunset now. Uh, that's uh, five hours of collection, and we're 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 at we're we're at the at, at sunset. And then looking over into the uh, Atlantic, we, we've got openings now into uh, Europe. Here's the Canary Islands and down here into South America. Uh, 24 hours worth of this. A lot of energy in here to the Northeast. Not so much in here. Still pretty good. But look at the, the backside of the beam. Australia, New Zealand, and up here into Alaska. That's doing pretty good. And over here in the Atlantic, here we are again in Antarctica, a whole bunch of signals over here uh, into South America. Um, and now, uh, and I can't remember which location this was, but we picked up a North uh, Africa station over here. Now, I broke it down by, uh, by, by bands. So here's the 20 meter band. You can see the Pacific We've got the energy over here toward the Atlantic and still a whole lot back over here, but it's more toward the Atlantic. 17 meters kind of looks the same. It changes the colors of the lines that are on here, depending what band you're on. So we've got a pretty good amount of energy to the Northeast, still some back here uh, into Australia. 15 meters, kind of similar. Here we got the contact down here again in um, Antarctica. You can see we're we're losing a few of the signals down here into Australia. <clears throat> On the 12 meter band, pretty good amount of energy to the northeast. Uh, nothing over here toward the Pacific because we're aimed east. That's what you expect is the energy in this direction. Uh, th this antenna is, is is pretty good in terms of front to back on uh, on the 12 meter band. And on the 10 meter band, uh. Interestingly enough, we, we talked to Antarctica on there, pretty good amount of energy here to the northeast. And a lot of this is simply related to what the propagation of the ionosphere was doing <laughs> in, in July this, this past year. Now, um, one of the things we wanted to do is to try to see what the front to back ratio was. So our plan was <laughs> to rotate the beam uh, to the west at 1145 a.m. And at that time, we rotated it, and that's basically uh, this point right here that I'm showing with the cursor. And when we did that, I took a look at that at the, some of the data, and I found that K4IQJ had some pretty stable signals in there. So we took a took an average of when it, we were aimed to the east, it was about minus 10.9 dB, and when we moved to the west. We were on the back side of the beam. We were seeing minus 21.6. And uh, to get the front to back, we simply subtract those two numbers. It's 10.7 dB. Now, keep in mind that it depends exactly where that guy is. He was to the east, uh, downside of the beam. And, he was, and when we turned it around, he was directly off the back side of the beam. Uh, and you remember that we had some influence from all these different uh, things, the, the metal roof and the wiring and, and the railroad tracks. So it, it's like part of the energy was kind of shifted up to the northeast. So that probably influenced it slightly. Here's a spec on the beam, peak front to back 12 dB. So we're a little bit off. Now this, this is predicted and we got a little over 10. So that's not bad. Perhaps with more experimentation, we could say let's let's accommodate the, uh, the 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 values that we have and try to pick either a, a station that's in that northeast corridor, or uh, reorient the beam slightly so that we get uh, better uh, signal information from that that guy over there in uh, in Mississippi. Now this is the pattern of the beam. I know this is not. Whisper itself, but the Force 12 beam has a lot of energy in the forward direction. But look here on 20 meters, there's a whole lot of energy off the backside. It's it's down 12 dB, but see, there's a whole lot coming off the backside. Those different bands have similar things. Uh, and when you get down here to the 10 meter band, it gets really squirrely. You get these multiple lobes that are sticking out there. We're not going to spend time on this, but uh, 
that's just something to consider that sometimes you're aimed in one direction and you're getting signals off in different directions. So um, we wanted to take a look now when we were aimed west. So over 24 hours, here's what we saw. We're, the energy now should be going over here to the west. And you look and you say, well, look at all this energy here to the northeast. Remember, there's a bunch of stuff off the backside of that beam. So this energy over here, we... We have to take a look at the actual values, which I don't have a chart for that. But if you're serious about these kinds of things, you look at the actual values of these different points that are being received to see if this is higher energy than this backside. Even though there's a bunch of them, it could be lower energy over here to the backside of the beam. Um, so here's the Pacific view. You remember what we had earlier? We had a few coming down here. Uh, here's a lot of going here to Australia, even got the western side of Australia. Now we're picking up the folks over here in Japan and uh, quite quite a few here in uh, in New Zealand. Uh, over uh, onto the uh, Atlantic side, pretty good coverage here into um, into Europe. But some of the ones here in the northern part of Europe that we had earlier, we don't have anymore. This time, though, a kind of interesting propagation was open. This is Reunion Island back here. And off the backside, we're getting our friends down here in Antarctica. I think they've got some pretty good antennas down there, too. Now, how robust is the software? That's the question that gets asked a great deal. Uh, this is going to be a demonstration of that. Uh, so what I did was I, I have the, so the software running on my MacBook, and it's connected to my uh, TS-890. The antenna, I want to impress you with this, is a three-foot piece of stranded wire shoved into one of the antenna connectors uh, on the TS-890. This was about 7.30 at night, kind of about the same time that we're doing this, uh, this meeting. And it's the 40-meter band. And uh, what we have to do is set things up for whisper. So I thought I'd mention this to you because I want to show you how difficult this is. Uh, you go over here uh, when you fire up WSJTX, and here at the top part of it, you click on Mode. It'll give you this drop-down menu. You choose Whisper. And when you have that selected, you can go over here and choose which band that you want to be on. If, if you are connected to your radio, it will automatically program the frequency. If not, when you click on this, it will show you the frequencies that you need to tune to on your radio. So if you're doing it manually, you can do it that way. The other thing that you need to do is to click on upload spots. So assuming that you're on the internet, you click on upload spots. And, and that, that's how it's going to be sent to PSK Reporter so that you can see these things uh, on, uh, uh, on, on WhisperNet. The other thing you'll do is to go into settings and choose reporting. And then uh, down here um, in the network services, enable PSK reporter spotting. Uh, there's pros and cons of whether you have to do this or not. I have read some people say, don't worry about it. Others say you need to check it. I simply go ahead and check it and don't worry about it. So, uh, when you have all that set up and that's all you have to do, you simply click on this monitor. And when you click on the monitor button, it turns green. And after a couple of minutes, you'll start seeing a call sign showing up because you're, you're receiving them. That's really all it takes. Here on the lower part of the screen, it'll say you're receiving whisper. And so that'll, that'll take care of it. Sometimes uh, there is a slight delay for when these get posted on uh, WhisperNet, but generally it's it's uh, it's it's fairly quick. So let's just see what uh, the what the ear can discern. When I added this comment, if the ear can't discern it, the software can. And I'm going to give you a few seconds of what the signal sounded like on this three foot wire that I was testing in, in the in the other day.
Now, I hope that nobody is going to raise their hand and say, I'm, I heard a whole bunch of signals in there. But all you heard was a bunch of noise. There were no, no tones or anything, that sort of thing. However, over a 30-minute period, and this is about 20 minutes of that 30, here are the stations that were decoded from that noise on 40 meters. This is just to give you an example of the robustness of the software and how you'll fool yourself. Some of you, if you're on FT8, may have had the same experience where you don't hear anything or it's very, very weak and you think, the, I can't do anything with that and you're able to work a station. I'll give you a quick example on FT8. One day I had, uh, I was testing my radio and I had, had it hooked up with a 10 foot piece of coax. The coax was probably leaky, I'll say that, but it was laying on the floor hooked up to a dummy load. And I was running some tests. And while I was playing around, I was playing with FT8 in the tune mode. And suddenly the monitor came on and I guess I must have touched it and it decoded uh, several dozen stations. And one of those stations was in South Africa. And I worked him using a dummy load. So there's some amazing things you can do with work with, with the weak signal. So now let, let's take a look at that stuff that I showed you over there on the whisper screen. This is uh, from the uh, um, whisper watch app. Here's a partial list of the various stations that were picked up and a, a graphical image of those on the 40 meter band. Uh, this app uh, does some analysis in, in various things. We're not going to talk about that, but uh, let's blow up this map here a little bit. Here, here's, the, uh, here's my location, and you can see at um, 7.30 at night on the 40-meter band with that noise that we had where those stations were located. And it kind of gives you an idea of, and this makes sense. This, this is shortly after sunset. And it should be leaning toward the east more than it does to the west. Now, Whisper is kind of a, a, a great tool because all antennas are a compromise. Uh, there's no such thing as a perfect antenna. An old saying says, if you put a piece of metal in the air, it'll radiate or it'll receive. The nice thing is WSJTX is free. Hams love free. Uh, you can use this if you're going to be uh, investigating propagation. Uh, you can use this uh, for evaluating your antennas or for comparing antennas, as well as different installations. Uh, as you saw, 200 milliwatts can do some amazing things. That's all we were using on all these tests. And if you're already using FT8 or FT4, you're all set. So it makes it a whole lot easier. Uh, if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Uh, and by the way, if you want to contact me about any of this, if I went too fast, kr1zan at arrl.net, and I'll be happy to uh, answer any questions that you might have. Well, thank you, Frank. Uh, I didn't know anything at all about uh, Whisper, so uh, hopefully other folks uh, enjoyed it. And again, we recorded the uh, the presentation, so if anybody missed it, we're going to link it on our YouTube page and uh, add the URL uh, resource page to the website as well. So um, I don't know if anybody has any questions. Um, Set it up at home now. Yeah, right. Absolutely. I think you hit on a couple of things that aren't specific to Whisper, but kind of pertinent to HF, where we have a lot of new generals getting licensed, and everything impacts everything. And if you wait for the perfect scenario to get on to HF, it'll never happen. You'll you'll die before that happens. So um, even if you've got a 2.71 SWR and an antenna that's not supposed to work, give it a shot generate a little bit of smoke. That's how we learn what we're doing. Yeah. I, I will say this. I am a big believer in NFED half waves. Uh, I will credit uh, Tim Watson with introducing me to those several years ago when we had a, a, a an activity at one of the lighthouses. And I bought one, uh, an all-bander that I can't get over. 
how simple it was to implement. It's 80 through six meters, and I can outperform some of the guys with big beams. The iPhone 7, Audio is a little weak. You're gonna have, you're gonna have to come up to the speaker if you want. Sorry. Stand by. There we go. Um, if you're uh, if you got an ICOM 7300 and you've been doing FT8, what are the difference in the presets uh, with the the whisper as opposed to the FT8. Is there a big change or? There, there shouldn't be, there, there shouldn't be uh, any kind of a change. Uh, you're still wanting to, uh, you, for one thing, all of your audio is only going to be in a 200 hertz window. So they demand for having your bandwidth full width is not necessarily there. Uh, so I would want to transmit narrow, for example. You can. Uh, well, um, uh, you're when you're transmitting, you're probably not going to be filtering anything. Um, well, it, receive too. I would just leave it just like FT8. Uh, and uh, since I don't have a 7300 myself, you can always take a look at some of the YouTubes uh, inquire for this IC7300 whisper, and there's going to be somebody out there who's experimented and found something that does or doesn't work. Uh, the at, Down at the uh, Garland Communications Center, we have a 7300, and when we use it, we set it up just like for FT8, and we either transmit or receive on it, and everything works fine. Great. Okay. And one more question. Was you on the second floor with that antenna or on the first floor or when you were doing the dummy load? I was on the second floor. How high were you up with it? <laughs> oh, how high? Uh, that probably would have been, um, you think of that, this was the house in Plano, um, 15 feet. I don't know. Okay. That's all I got. <laughs>